Hello, dear fellow singers from nearby and far away. Uh, on this very sunny spring day, I'd like to share with you some thoughts about diction. Diction for classical singers, professional singers. So that is quite a restriction of the subject. Um, the English word diction, I believe, is used for two things. First of all, the art, the skill of um, clear pronunciation and articulation. So the technique of bringing forth the, the, the words, the text, in a very understandable way. That's one chapter, and I think the other part of the meaning of diction is handling of foreign languages in which we are supposed to sing. So that is more an intellectual thing. You need the knowledge of those languages, at least for the purpose of classical singing. So again, the clear diction is technique, it's physical. The correct diction is more intellectual and it's knowledge. Let's start with the first thing, the, uh, the technique of pronouncing. Uh, obviously we deal with consonants and vowels and consonants can be subdivided into voiced consonants and unvoiced consonants. Uh, for you singers, that must be nothing new. And vowels, personally, I can subdivide them into the wider vowels and the more narrow vowels. Wider, like A, O, E. <clears throat> My singing voice is not what it used to be. And the more narrow vowels, like and how to deal with all that. Okay, uh, we could, to make this even a little clearer, slide along the vowels from wide to more closed. Look at this. slowly the, the mouth closes and the vowels get more narrow and the other set all more narrow okay um, why is all this important. Well, most of you I needn't tell, of course. The singing is not, is rarely leader ohne Worte, it's rarely without text. Yet we are aware that sometimes singers, particularly of the old school and some very famous and very good, sing and make us wonder Actually, in what language is she or he singing? Is that Italian or Chinese or Hebrew? Well, I will not mention names because there are so many examples of others who have a perfect clear diction and are a joy to listen to. For instance, uh, for the longest time I've enjoyed Nikolai Geda, in that respect. And then, of course, Dietrich Fischer Disco was very known for his clear diction, but also Marilyn Horn and Ellie Ameling, typical leader singer, and many others. And from present generation, I've worked with uh, William Sharp, who is very aware of pronunciation diction, and even very young generation, Corbin Phillips, is also very good in that respect. 
and it's um it is really should be a part of the technique of a classical singer just like singing in tune uh, singing a forte that is not forced singing uh, a pianissimo that is not covered or misty uh, having a good breath technique and all that good uh, agility of course handling of the consonants and vowels is just as important as all that and it happens to me that when I'm listening to a concert with various soloists and you enjoy beautiful voices, beautiful music, beautiful technique and then one of them stands up and sings and suddenly you're aware of what the person is singing and there's a sort of a, my heart is jumping because suddenly I seem to think this person is not just delivering beautiful sounds upon me to be uh, take it or leave it so <laughs> he just gives me delivers but the one who gives me words and text he sort of takes me by the hand through this piece and uh, makes me enjoy the words, the, the story of that opera or oratorio or leader recital. So for me it's a joy to hear good diction and I hope it's the same for you. Now let's um, get to work. Um, of course, you all do your warming up exercises, many of them, uh, scales, vocalese, uh, fast runs, slow runs, whatever, breath exercises. Go on doing that, don't skip any of that, but add to that some suggestions that I have for uh, special exercises for vowels and consonants. We'll do some exercises for consonants and for vowels. Consonants first and of course the voiced consonants like M and N and Z and all that, they are very helpful for placement and for filling in the gaps between the vowels. Uh, I have a couple of um, fantasy exercises that I use for myself and with my students. For instance, uh, listen to this. So, as you hear, there is a repeat of the N and the M. The M is in the middle. Nam, num, and the vowels, the A and the U. They vary a bit, and at the end there is a E, which is called schwa, I think, the mute E. And I have that on a scale like melody, but the sense it makes is that during those voiced consonants, you feel in your resonance cavities that it keeps resonating, that it keeps sounding, and that the sound doesn't stop during consonants and when you have discovered that for yourself in case you didn't already then it is easier to articulate and yet uh, keep your legato and your line uninterrupted this uh, exercise i've just did can be varied in numerous ways for instance by changing some of those consonants. Let's do now a Z. 
instead of the N. And let's do an E and an O as two different vowels. So then we get <clears throat> Zim, Zom, 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 Zim. And we can vary again. Rim, 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 rim. As you see, for the U, my lips go forward. U. For the E, my corner of my mouth goes wide. Rim, 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 rim. So I'm also performing some kind of gymnastics for the lips and the tongue. And then the L, also a very good one. I'm uh, exaggerating the amount of resonance on those consonants because I want to make you notice it and I want to make you feel it when you do this after me exaggerating as well. So this can be varied at will however you want it. Uh, I keep composing new melodies of course you can do that. And it's an arpeggio and all kinds of things. But the next step after these fantasy sounds is to take real words, perhaps from arias or songs that you like, and a, a phrase that is uh, appropriate for this purpose. Now, one of my favorites is Schlummert ein ihr matten Augen from, uh, from a Bach uh, aria to be sung by either soprano or bass voice in different pitches, of course. Um, and as you will hear, this has interesting uh, sounds. I will do it on a sort of a three meter rhythm. <clears throat> Schlummert ein ihr matten Augen, schlummert ein ihr matten Augen. <coughs> Goodbye Schleim is what the Germans would say. This text, Schlummert ein ihr matten Augen, uh, presents a couple of challenges. The double M of Schlummert, the double T of matten, and both in German and in Italian, double consonants should sound double. But then also the word ein, schlummert ein, should start with an ever so slight glottis, because in German you shouldn't say schlummert ein, but schlummert ein, with an ever so small opening. And also matten Augen should not sound with matten Augen, but matten Augen. So again, Schlummert ein ihr matten Augen, schlummert ein ihr matten Augen. Now, this can be uh, varied with any phrase from any kind of aria that you like, and that presents nice uh, problems in French. Here, the double consonants do not sound double. That's taboo in French. It's all a bit more smooth and legato. <clears throat> you will recognize this text probably. Allons enfants de la patrie, allons enfants de la patrie. At once you've heard an example of liaison, allons enfants, and of nasal sounds, enfants. Um, and although allons is with double L, it doesn't sound allons. That would sound too Italian or German. This allons enfants. Now, one 
phrase that I uh, invented myself. Freuden tränen auf den Wangen. All those fr and tr and wangen. Very good uh, challenge to try. Freuden tränen auf den Wangen. Freuden tränen auf den Wangen. Din wangen, the N goes to the V of wangen, both voiced, so they help each other. One uh, transports the resonance from one vowel to the other. Auf din wangen, din wangen. So that's another thing with those voice consonants they help each other italian of course is very good for double consonants quella fiamma che macende maybe you remember this from your first or second voice lesson it's by benedetto marcello uh, quella fiamma da di da da. and so on here it comes Quella fiamma che macende, quella fiamma che macende. Double L, double M, and double Ch macende. Um, now, very close to Italian, of course, is Latin, because that's also pronounced the Italian way most of the time. And from the Mass, we know quoniam tu solus sanctus. Also quite uh, agile for the lips. Quoniam tu solus sanctus, quoniam tu solus sanctus. In the previous, we had the uh, accende, and here we have the sanctus, all those n and k sounds that allow us to sing on, to hum on. And then why not a bit in English, if uh, I think it's from Messiah, if God be for us, who shall be against us? Or can be against us, I forget. <clears throat> if God be for us, who shall be against us? If God be for us, who shall be against us? Or against? Um, here, for a non-English speaker, it's very important to say God and not God, which Germans or Dutch people would easily say. And for us, for us, can have a very little tongue tip R1. One little rattle of the tongue. The vowels. Um, some people have problems with some vowels more than with others. The, the very open ones, ah and air, could become too uncovered, as we say. Then it's ah, air. That's what we call uncovered, but it can be rounder. Oh, eh. then I think it's still ah and still eh, but a little more round, a little more covered. And that's, of course, a special art. You doubtlessly work on that all the time. Now, suppose you have a, a vowel that tends to be too open, too uncovered, then perform a massage from an easier vowel, like the O of the O, that's always a very helpful one. O, O, it's so nice and round. And you go from that to the A. O, O, be better but well, in my old age uh, I allow myself that. Now suppose um, the more narrow vowels like oo 
are too closed off. Then have it accompanied by or or a, which is nice and open, and try a sort of a skin transplant from the a to the u. Okay, now suppose you lack brilliance and focus in a few vowels, then as we know, the very narrow ones like e and u and u, they often have a surplus of focus and brilliance. So let's suppose that the a ah is often a bit ah, a bit misty, and try this. <clears throat> So the brilliance of the E is transported to the A. Um, the U, this is very technical, has a habit of lowering the larynx. If you sing from any vowel towards U, then you feel that your Adam's apple goes down. E -u -a -u. But it is said that, in fact, a somewhat low larynx is helpful for the beauty, not only of the U, but of all vowels. Should not be exaggerated. But when the larynx is high, then it's a little bit childish sound. And when the larynx is lower, formidabile, ave maria, then that is rounder, it's more covered, it's more agreeable. Now for that, the U is a helpful device because the U lowers the larynx. If, and if you go from A to A to U and try to Keep that larynx in place. So far the vowels as opposed to consonants. But now we'll go back to including some consonants because there's more interesting stuff to say about this. And I'll call this um, timing or anticipation of consonants. Um, what I mean is this. If I clap a rhythm and I speak words, then is the, the beat, the sound, the, the note, is it beginning with the beginning of the word? Or is it beginning with the vowel, the first vowel of the word? That's the case, the latter. When you sing, for instance, schlummert ein ihr matten Augen, I take this text again that I've used before, then bef before the first vowel, the U, we have S-C-H-L, but all that should be pronounced before the beat on which the U comes, and then after that the double M, schlummert, a uh, is the vowel, comes on the next beat. Ein, that of course has no consonant, so it's only a vowel. Ihr matten Augen. So I will now try to do this placement, this timing of consonants. 
Um, I've got three here. One, two, three. One, two, three. Schlummert eine Girmaten Augen. Once ago, once again. <clears throat> Schlummert ein ihr matten Augen. Before the first beat, you heard the sch. And I really have to anticipate those all those consonants for the oop to be on the beat. Now, I haven't invented this myself. There is a book by the famous English leader accompanist Gerald Moore who made a design of this he put the uh, the beat on a certain place and he printed S C H L U the U under the note and the S C H L before and so on and so on so he made this anticipation of consonants visible so I haven't invented it. It's, it's um, an authority in leader singing who said this, but I suppose that everybody who tries to do justice to consonants will agree with this. The practical use is that on the beat there is sound in the accompaniment either a chord in the piano or a chord in the orchestra. So there is more sound, more noise than before the beat. So if you pronounce consonants before the beat, they have more chance of being heard. Whereas the vowel on the beat will sound better anyhow, because it's a vowel, it, it has more sound. Schlummert ein ihr Matten Augen and so on. So, so far the timing and the anticipation of consonants within beats. Another observation about consonants. I already uh, ventilated that they are so helpful if you want to see it. Now, the consonants can help one another. They can help the following vowel. They can help the expression. And they can help your link with your audience. They help each other. That's, for instance, in situations like am Brunnen vor dem Tore, am Brunnen. You have the M, the B and the R, am Brunnen. All three of them, M, B, R, have a nice humming quality and they give that quality to one another. In dulce jubilo, in dulce, mmd. Both voiced, they help each other. When you are singing them with awareness, they both become very clear. Then, um, a well placed consonant can also help the following vowel. Uh, you might say the consonant being the sparkle and the vowel, the flame. The flame will not be there before this first a lighter, a, a, a sparkle. Um, tanto, tanto, uh, fiamma, the t, the f, they bring forward your lips, they activate the clearness and they will help not only themselves but also the following vowel. Männer suchen zu naschen. Männer suchen stets zu naschen. M, M, 
zu, zu. They all help each other. Then I said, consonants can help the expression. Of course, we have many means of expression. We can sing louder and softer and more legato, less legato, um, quicker and slower, and so on and so on, darker or brighter. But we can also fill our consonants with expression. Let's take the gr of Ich grolle nicht. Ich grolle nicht. The gr in the meaning of the word grollen is rather powerful and harsh. But the gr also appears in the French word gracieusement. Ich grolle nicht. Tu es je gracieux, gracieux. Then the gr can start sound very mild and very uh, graciously. The W of Wut. Ich fühle jetzt viel Wut. Then the V almost has an explosive quality. But that same W appears in the word weich. Ach, du fühlst ja so weich. V. Then the W has a caressing quality. So either explosive V or caressing. Then um, the last, the fourth. A fourth way in which consonants can help that is creating a link between you and your audience i already mentioned that a little earlier when i listen and i suddenly can hear the words of a singer that i've been taken by my hand i feel included in the whole story so i suspect when you sing with a lot of clear diction you have a better grip on your listeners. We are now coming to the second chapter of this whole lecture about diction. As I told you in the beginning, um, diction when it means clear pronunciation is a technical or physical matter, but when it means correct pronunciation of the foreign languages in which we sing, then it's more an intellectual matter. I will state once more that what I'm dealing with here is only the stage language, the Bühnensprache, as it's called. So how we pronounce classical texts, Shakespeare, Goethe, Moliere, and only for the use of stage performances, um, and that's quite sometimes quite different from conversational language, as you may understand. Um, let's look at the R, the R, which is quite a a difficult thing in various languages. But in speaking, the R is different in English, in French, in German, in Italian. However, in stage language of all those languages, it's all a tongue tip R, a rolling R, but rolling in different ways in different languages. Southern Europe, Italian and Spanish, has generous rolling. Prego, amore, real rrr, the real rattle. French and German rattle a little more modestly. Charmant, grande, Mein Vater, mein Vater. 
die tränen tropfen. And in English, it's also quite modest. My brethren, for unto us a child is born. So, in these cases, French, German, English don't rattle too much like you would do in Spanish and Italian, but do have a tongue tip R with almost one or two little rattles. In English, there is something interesting with the R towards the end of a word. It's very often not pronounced. Father, father. It's not usually not pronounced like father. It is when you say father of heaven, father of heaven. Uh, then a vowel is following and it can be a nice trait d'union between the two words. Also, right before the end of a word, like first and march, you don't speak, even in stage language, you don't speak first and march. So first, march, the R is completely ignored. Then, something interesting about double and single consonants. I already mentioned that before in our exercises. And here, the foreign languages that we um, deal with, usually English, French, German, Italian. In this case, two of them go hand in hand. German and Italian do pronounce double consonants. As I said before, but I'll say it again. Ich hatte viel Bekümmernis. Hatte, real double T, Bekümmernis, real double M. In Italian, Quella fiamma che macende. Quella fiamma macende. Then, a subject where again, some of those languages go hand in hand and others don't. Aspiration. What do I mean by that? It's when you say T for two and uh, pony and coming. So the T, P and K have a little H behind them. T, two, coming. This is the case in English and in German, common passen tanzen, k, p, k. So the consonant with a little h after it. But it's tabu in French and Italian. It would sound ridiculous if you say tu or passe ma cette chose. Or in Italian, come scolio. It's come, passo, tanto, not tanto, or even less tanto, with a, a so-called wet T. So, be very aware of aspiration, uh, English and German, yes, French and Italian, no. Then, the length and the coloring of vowels. Let me show what I mean. In English, you have the word foot and the word food. The food for the dog, for the dog is near my foot. One is a, a short U and the other is a long U. In German, that happens with uh, Mutter, U, uh, Mutter, a short U, uh, and Blume, a long U. Uh. And this is a very important thing because the color of the vowel also changes a bit. 
Listen, for instance, to I beg you take this bag from my back. Beg, bag, back. A German or a Dutchman who wouldn't know better would say, I beg you take this bag from my back. Back, back, back. But that would sound very un English. So, although they're all, all three are variations of E, eh, they sound quite different. Bag, bag, back. Um, and as you know, the first two are long, bag, bag, and the other one is short, back. Being long or short has an influence on the color, the pronunciation. Same in German, uh, there is, I'm uh, giving this phrase very often, schlummert uh, eine Mattenaugen in the Bach Kandata. Schlummert ein. In my first performance of this, not knowing much, I sang schlummert ein with a real beautiful oh, oh, just like Blumen. And then the conductor corrected me, and he was not even German himself, he was Hungarian, but he knew German very well. Peter Erich was his name. Uh, he said, it's not schlu, it's schlu. So it's more towards o than towards u. Because when you pronounce it in the short way, schlummern, then it's u. But when Bach makes you lengthen that, then you still have to maintain that u. And this, of course, happens in English and in German equally. So be aware of the different shades, the different colors of what basically is the same vowel. We have that in German also in Frühling or Zurück. Zurück is a short U and Frühling is a, short, a long U. And we have it in Liebe and Bitten. Ich bitte and it's more I. And Liebe is real I. Okay, so far now we go to a very French subject, the liaison. Uh, liaison means an adaptation of the regular pronunciation according to what the poetry wants. Um, nous avons is one example. Nous. The word nous is usually pronounced without the s at the end. Not nous avons, but when the next, next word starts with a vowel, avons, then the previous s is heard and is also changed into a z. Nous avons. Uh, masques et bergamasques. Masque. Masque, the s is not heard, but when it's followed by a, masques et bergamasques, then you hear the s and it will change into z. Un fait accompli. Un fait is without the T, although it's written, but fait accompli, there you do hear the T because of the following A, accompli. This is a very complicated subject because there are three subdivisions into this whole matter of liaison. There are liaison that you must do, obligatory. There are ones that are forbidden, that you will never do, and there are ones that you only do at will. Um, the compulsory ones are, amongst others, after an article. Les, les enfants. 
euh, les maisons, then there the S would not be heard, les maisons. But les enfants, the S is heard because enfant starts with a vowel. In that case, it's uh, compulsory. Also, after personal pronouns. Ils ont peur. Ils marchent. They walk. Ils marchent. The S is not heard, but ils ont peur. They have peur. They are afraid. There the S is heard. Nous avons chanté. Not nous avons, nous avons. So this is after personal pronouns. Those are two cases of the section compulsory. Then the section forbidden. You cannot make a liaison before an ash aspiré. <laughs> what on earth is an ash aspiré? It's an aspirated H and it's usually the H at the beginning of foreign words, foreign words in the French language. For instance, les Hollandais. It is written les Hollandais, but it sounds les Hollandais and not les Hollandais, although Hollandais seems to begin with a vowel, but it doesn't because there is an H, which we don't hear. Les Hollandais and also les héros, the, the heroes, les héros. That's also a foreign word introduced in the French language. However, when this H is in a real French word, les heures and les hommes, they start with an H, les heures and les hommes, then you don't hear the H, but you do hear the les hommes, les heures, les hommes. So in this case, you really have to be aware, is this H aspiré or not? Um, now, how do I know that? Well, in good French dictionaries, words starting with an H will have a little asterisk, a little sign to indicate whether this is an H aspiré or not. Uh, that was the second category, forbidden liaison. Then there is the third category, at libitum. You can do it or you cannot do it. Um, in this case, you ask yourself, am I using very official or very classical language or is it popular and conversational? In conversation, you would use the minimum in this category of attributum. In official speech, uh, like announcements or classical stage, classical drama, you would use the maximum of these. And I was never as aware of that as long ago in a masterclass given in Holland by Pierre Bernac, the very famous French leader singer, melody singer, and the teacher of Gérard Souzet and Ali Amoui. He gave masterclasses all over the world. He wrote the book um, singing in French or something like that, in which one whole chapter is devoted to the liaison. He came to Holland for his masterclass when I was a young singer, 21, 22, I don't know, and I attended as a student. And part of the masterclasses was to have lunch together, so we were sitting at the big table and the maestro was at the head of the table and all the students around him. And he was speaking French with us because the Dutch of that generation were proud enough to have learned some French, so they wanted to show off. And during conversation, he was not using that many <coughs> liaisons, 
But then somebody came in and brought a letter that had just arrived for him, for him and he said, well, this is interesting. I just read this and I will read it out to you. He stood up and he read this letter and suddenly he made more liaison in that category of activity. So far, a little story about Pierre Bernac. Um, another phenomenon about um, pronunciation, the legato or the glottis, I mentioned the glottis a little before, um, in German, a glottis is very common. In French, it's completely taboo. Uh, am Abend da es kühle war, am Abend, am Abend da es kühle war. A French singer who wouldn't know better would sing, am Abend, he would sing, Mabend, am Abend, that's French, but it's taboo in German. However, in French, we try every possibility to make words uh, connected. So if we have an opportunity for a glottis, for instance, que a il dit? What has he said? What did he say? Que a il dit. That would be the skeleton of what did he say. But the French, they make this into qu'a-t-il dit. So the que, a, is put together. Q apostrophe, qu'a-t-il dit, Q, U apostrophe, qu'a. And then between, between a, il, they simply put a T that they grab out of somewhere, the T that had nothing to do with it at all, but it was just to fill the gap between two vowels. Que a il would be impossible, so qu'a t il dit. Um, the English language almost never does that, because I, but I've heard in conversation English that two vowels who get next to each other in this way are separated by a tiny little r. Uh, the English audience knows better than I. Then something very French of course is the nasality. Uh, there are four kinds of nasal sounds in French. Un, 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 un. Un in malin or impossible. En in lent, the year, or ambulance, or en voyage, or l'enfant. On, ondulé, and l'ombre. Un, l'un et l'autre, an humble. Il est humble. So, this could be either the vowel and an N or the vowel and an M. Uh, malin or impossible. In impossible, it's not I N, it's I M. But in pronunciation, you don't hear neither the N nor the M because you only hear the nasal sound. So, if you pronounce, if you sing, Oh, c'est impossible. If you pronounce that M before the P, then you're wrong, because it should only be impossible, without any trace of an M. However, when, even in this case, there is a liaison, then, you do hear the N or the M. For instance, un bon enfant. Bon, enfant, but enfant starts with an E, so bon, the N will be heard. Un bon enfant. 
And now notice, since the N of bon enfant is audible, it is no longer a nasal sound. It's not bon, bon enfant, bon enfant. So it's either nasal without the final consonant, or it's nasal, it's not nasal, with the final consonant. Then there is something to be said about local Latin. What on earth do I mean by that? It's the Latin spoken not in the Italian way like we usually do, but for instance in the German way. This is done by specialized groups, but we do know the easiest difference is between German Latin and Italian Latin. Um, we have, of course, uh, for instance, quoniam tu solus sanctus, in German would sound like quoniam tu solus sanctus. So you really uh, approach it in the German way. An S at the beginning is not solus, it's solus sanctus. The vowels are also more German than Italian. Also, we know that Agnus Dei in German would be Agnus Dei. Then a very important thing is that CH in German, it is either guttural or it is soft guttural in words like Bach, Buch, Loch and Auch and soft in words like Sich, Frech, uh, Euch and Früchten. So after A, O, U without umlaut it's harsh. Bach, Buch, Loch. However, when an umlaut is added, then becomes soft. Ein Bach, zwei Bechlein. There is a umlaut and it's not Bechlein, Bechlein. Ein Buch, zwei Bücher. Not Bücher, Bücher. Ein Loch, zwei Löcher. When it is the E, the E, and the Ö, then it's always the soft one, sich, frech, euch, Bücher. The B sometimes has a challenge when you have a problem making it voiced, when bist du bei mir would sound bist du bei mir, then think the little M before the B, bist du bei mir then it will really be a voiced B. The same thing happens with a D when you have a problem making it not sound like a T. Uh, dove sono, when it tends to be dove sono, then put not a little M but a little N. Dove, dove sono, then the D is really voiced. We go to C. Uh, this can be pronounced like a K, come, and cantatrice in Italian, but like a ch when in Italian it comes before E and E, like centro and città. We all have learned that, of course, in our Italian lessons. In French, there is the same kind of difference depending on what follows. Um, in French, uh, comma, it's uh, the C before an O and A is pronounced as a K, but it is pronounced as S before E and I, centre and citron. We go to the letter E, the sound E. 
There are three varieties of this. We have E, E, and E, all written with the sign of an E. The E is like the French accent aigu, the E like French accent grave, and the E is a schwa or a mute E. In the word, in the French word élève, we find all three of them. Élève, E, E, E. In German we have die Seele, das Meer, that is E, then mit Schrecken, that is E, and bescheiden, that is E. It is important that in French and German the E is rather narrow. Die Seele, the lips are really flat like this, not die Seele. And in French, dans euh, l'été, real e, e, not e, e, l'été. That would be more Italian approach or English. Uh, then we look at the schwa, the e. Uh. Mein Vater, mein Vater, or behaupten. <clears throat> Vater, the last syllable has e. Behaupten, the first and the last have e. In German, they are a bit open. Mein Vater, behaupten. <clears throat> Whereas in French, they are very closed. Like, je me demande, e, 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 with almost closed lips. Uh, there was once a Dutch, uh, a German colleague performing in Amsterdam. He was very young and very promising. And he, knowing that he would sing a recital in Amsterdam, uh, took the trouble of learning French repertoire as well. The Dutch like a uh, varied repertoire of French, English, German. So he sang German before intermission and French after. And it was very good, the French, except one sound, but that was the schwa. He did not make the schwa enough closed, je me demande, but did it in the German way, Je me demande, and that way you would not hear a clear difference between le and le, me and ne, le and la. So I talked to him after the performance backstage, and I made sure not to sound like a teacher. I said, So wonderful, and your French is so good, except for that one thing just to remember. And he was very helpful that I told him this. English has something else in the schwa. It sounds not like German nor like French. It sounds a bit like ah. Uh, for instance, father. <coughs> the voice is gone. Father in heaven. <coughs> Father in heaven. So it's almost father. And also the lady. The Americans do this more than the British. But be aware that it's not done in other languages. The V is an interesting thing in German. Words like Vater and Von, although written with a V, are pronounced with an F, Vater, Von. But not in German words of foreign background, like Violine and Vibrato. Die Violine and das Vibrato, here the V sounds almost like a W. A tricky uh, exercise for French language. Les yeux, les cieux, les oeufs, and les jeux. 
Les yeux is the eyes. It's written with Y E U. Les cieux is the heavens. It's written with C I E U. Les oeufs is the eggs. It's written O E U. It, it looks like oeufs, but it sounds like eux, les oeufs. And les jeux is the plays. It is written with J E U, les jeux. Well, with this little French joke, I will uh, round off this lecture. I hope you uh, have learned something or can use anything from it. Of course, you can play back if certain things uh, were not clear or forgotten. Uh, you can also look it up on various websites and you will find information about that in due course. Um, it was very improvised and as you may have noticed my voice, both the speaking voice and the singing voice, are not as trained and up-to-date anymore. In fact, I did my last public performance in 2018 in San Francisco uh, and that is on YouTube, I'm afraid. It's Cantata 158 by Bach. Um, then the voice was still sort of okay, but since that I've hardly sung, so I was a bit rusty in the previous hour, and I hope you forgive me. Um, thank you very much, good luck, and um, if you're in the neighborhood in Amsterdam, drop me a line. Bye-bye.